Hi, my name is Shreya, and welcome to my podcast, All About Her, where a confused high schooler, aka me, interviews influential women to learn about their experiences and advice for girls like me. Today I'll be speaking to a woman who is an assistant professor of mathematics at Bryn Mawr College. She mainly works with mathematical biology and endocrinology, but she's also a co-creator of Mathematically Gifted and Black, an organization which is focused on tackling underrepresentation in mathematics and mathematical sciences. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Erica Graham and let's jump right into it. So thank you so much for joining me today, Erica. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Can you just right uh just to start us off can you just introduce what your current career is and what you kind of specialize in right now sure i am an assistant professor of mathematics at Bryn Mawr college which is just outside of philadelphia and my research area in general is in mathematical biology but i'm specifically interested in problems in endocrinology so things like type 2 diabetes and reproductive hormone regulation. I think that's a really interesting field actually though mathematical biology I feel like I haven't really heard anyone say they got into that field or anything so out of curiosity how did you kind of narrow down into um, that field? So I like to say that it was entirely by accident Um, (laughs) so because I wasn't uh, completely sure of what I wanted to do as I approached college graduation. Um, what I did know even before I started college was that I was going to be a math major. Um, not be- for any other reason than it happened to be my favorite subject and everything else seemed to be my least favorite subject, um, <laughs> except for studying languages, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so. I got to college, I majored in math, I got to my senior year, and I just sort of like plugged away at the major, and um, one of my professors at the time uh, invited me to work on a senior thesis project with him, and he gave me two options, one of which was math biology, and I chose that one, so it was completely by happenstance, because funnily enough, I had sort of stayed away from biology the entire time I was in college because I thought I hated it, but that didn't actually turn out to be the case. So yeah, it was, it was completely by accident that I ended up in math biology, but that was my introduction to the field. And so when I was looking at graduate programs, I specifically looked at those that had a good research program in math biology. So definitely, um, kind of building up to this point, uh, I would assume that like you said, you had an idea that you wanted to major in math. Um, but kind of before that, did you have any idea of what your dream job would be or what you wanted to possibly do in the future, maybe when you were younger? So when I was way young, before I figured out that I did not really like lab sciences, <laughs> although I wholeheartedly respect people who work in labs because I use a lot of the work that they do and what I do. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of people want to be a doctor when they grow up and I was like that sounds kind of cool and then realized what that actually entailed and decided (laughs) that was probably not for me um so that's sort of my earliest memory of what it was that I wanted to be when I grew up and then as the years sort of went on I don't know that I actually formulated an idea of what that was going to look like for somebody who was interested in math but it turns out that the world is your oyster if you're a math major, so. (laughs) I think um, that's kind of an issue that I see around me, like the peers around me, me included, definitely, um, is that you're kind of so set on doing something in the future until you really realize what uh, it could possibly mean and what, you know, what you would have to do in that field. Um, So that's why I'm kind of doing this also to, you know, inform other people and so that they can actually understand what they might be getting themselves into before they go into it. Um, So kind of, again, going back to school um, when you were younger, how do you think your high school experience, your college experience um, shaped where you are today or um, if it completely derailed you for some time 
um, if you could just kind of comment on that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that, um, you know, looking back, there, I, I would say that I had a pretty sort of standard high school and college experience in the sense that I was never actively dissuaded from going into math. And I think that that actually made a huge difference. When I hear stories of um, fellow women mathematicians who have sort of like constantly been told by various people who are, you know, their professors or teachers um, sort of saying that they don't have what it takes to be a mathematician. I never had that experience. And so it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do it. (laughs) It was just a matter of whether I wanted to or not. Um, And that certainly was the case both in high school and in college. And so um, I never thought not to do it. The only thing that I sort of also will say occurred accidentally was that I had no idea that it was a mathematician that I wanted to be. I was not thinking about grad school. I wasn't thinking about becoming a professor. I was just kind of like, this is cool and I'll just keep doing it until I don't want to anymore. I don't fully recommend that mode. Uh, however, I think that I'm 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 very adamant when I tell my students um, and then tell them not to tell their parents I said this, but it's completely okay to not know what you want to do, even as an 18 year old, even as a 22 year old, even as a 30 year old. I mean, I think that you know sometimes our um, our values and our desires and motivations change um, as we have different experiences. And so to say that you have to know precisely what you want to do for the next next 50 or 60 years when you're 20 seems a little absurd to me. Um, (laughs) But some people do know that and and that's great. I was just not one of those people. (laughs) And so a lot of times I just sort of like to say, well, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but this is, this is, this is working for now. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and um, how did you develop this passion for math? And when, when did you develop this passion? So I honestly, I think that, um, I mean, I just have always liked math. I don't know that I thought of it as like, this is my passion, but I like figuring out puzzles and, you know, I like figuring things out. And even if it takes me forever, I enjoy that process of like trying to just work out problems. Um, And so I realized that, you know, as I got older, that that's probably a good thing when it comes to somebody who's interested in math. So I won't say that, like, you know, there was a pivotal moment where I was like, math is my thing. Um, (laughs) I will say that the way that my brain works, um, works very well with math, um, in terms of sort of like, the logical structure, and even some levels of abstractness, but like, it just makes sense in some ways, which is another reason why I like studying languages and music, for example. I'm not a musician, but, you know, there, there's something about the structure of studying, like, grammar and that kind of thing in other languages that caters to my mathematical mind. So it's just kind of like that, I, I'm not quite sure how to say this, um, like, the analytical side where you have to, like, use a lot of logical thinking, because I've spoken to yeah. a couple other mathematicians, too, and they seem to always come back to this thing of it's so logical that, and it's just like, it's not simple in any way, but it's a lot easier to think of um, because of that. Right. It works with my personal mode of intuition. So for other people, it's not intuitive and that's fine. But for me, it works with the way that I think and the way that I learn. Um, And so it sounded like a good idea. (laughs) Uh, So could you briefly touch on some struggles that you maybe um, faced prior to your career and how they compare to struggles that you might currently still face in your career today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, honestly, as I sort of mentioned, like my biggest struggle was actually figuring out what path to take. Um, And I actually took a couple years off between undergrad and grad school to take some time to figure that out. So I had a quote unquote real job. Um, and 
I worked for a couple of years and, you know, tried to figure out what my next steps were. And I really needed that time to not only find my motivation, but then just to also sort of think about, you know, what it was that I wanted to do five or 10 years down the line. Um, so I don't know that that's necessarily like the big struggle so much as a natural process in, you know, my growth as a person and, and in terms of my career. Um, I think that in terms of thinking of now what struggles look like, I realized that in retrospect, I had no idea what it meant to go into academia at all. I was like, I'm going to get a PhD and I will figure it out after that. <laughs> and I mean, and that's sort of like what I continually have done. But um, I think that, you know, determining, you know, once you get a PhD or if you're an applied mathematician trying to decide whether you go into industry, academia or government has, you know, different rules for each of those things. And academia seemed to be more in line with sort of what I enjoy doing and also, you know, how I like to interact with students. And so I think that um, that part of it helped. The challenge, though, is that um, one doesn't realize exactly what, what that entails. So it's not just about the teaching. It's not just about the research. I think it's sort of navigating um, this entire environment that is for me, arguably foreign. I didn't grow up with parents who were in academia, so I had no idea what that was like. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a focus of my graduate program. It was sort of like, I happened to have a great sort of, you know, group of mentors who could guide me in that way. Um, and so navigating all of those things and then also understanding how um, society plays a role in what academia looks like was also sort of eye-opening for me. And as a Black woman mathematician, that is something that um, is sort of like a constant struggle. But I think that through that struggle and then also because of it, I've been able to sort of network with like-minded and similar um, mathematicians who are in similar positions as I am. And so we sort of have this group of a support network, but then also, you know, a group that can actually affect change where, where we have the power to. And I think that's another recurring theme that I'm seeing is that um, once you like surround yourself with people who are, who have similar interests and things like that, um, you really start to understand where you fit in. And I think mm -hmm. that's obviously really hard to do in high school, but like to think about mm -hmm. like where you feel the most welcome and things like that is a uh, very important lesson that I think everyone can kind of take away. Um, mm -hmm. So I know you mentioned that you don't really have a particular like eureka moment where you were like, yes, I'm going to do math and that's it. But um, just kind of in general, do you have a specific moment or a period of time where you realize like, you know, that that was a moment where you're going to take away something really important about life in general and you just carried forward with you? Yeah, I mean, I think that there were several things. I think that with respect to my career, for example, and figuring out that math biology was it for me, um, was thinking about working on my senior thesis and how it didn't actually feel like work, right? Like I would spend hours either like figuring out, you know, equations or proofs of things or, or whatever it was. Um, and it was so interesting to me that I could just do that and not feel like I was actually doing work. And I was like, that sounds like something if I could get paid for, I would want to do. And so, you know, my advice there is to find the thing that you enjoy doing that doesn't feel like work and figure out a way to get paid for it. It doesn't have to be math. It could be something else. Um, and I, I mean, I think that you see a lot of people in a variety of fields who, you know, put up with not being in this necessarily sort of lucrative career, but because it's something that they're passionate about, or at the very least something that, you know, th they can work on and continually work on. And just because they have a, an extreme desire to do that. And that's where, you know, that's what defines them. And so 
from the mathematical side of things, I would say that that is, that is certainly true, at least for me. Um, and so I would say that moment came like in the transition between undergrad and like trying to figure out next steps. I was like, whatever I'm doing right now and getting paid for actually does feel like work. But what I was doing when I was a student in my senior year and thinking about math biology was a very different thing. Um, and so I think that, um, that portion of it and identifying what that thing is to you is really important. Um, I would say that the other thing is, um, being able to either comfortably or uncomfortably put yourself in a position where you are able to sort of network with different people. So I think, um, this happened again to me by accident, but there was, um, the Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education Program, or EDGE, that I participated in in my transition from undergrad to grad school. And I did not know that being part of that program, which is initially a summer program, would basically um, almost sort of define what I ended up doing from the time that I was a participant into what I do today, who I see at conferences, who I collaborate with, you know, and write papers with. Um, a lot of that is, I would attribute to that program. And that was, again, completely by happenstance, but what I took from that was, um, it's really important to find your people and to make sure that you have a support network because regardless of what it is that you end up doing post high school or post college, you're always going to want those people to be a support, um, so that, you know, they understand where you're coming from in terms of your career, but also know that, know you well enough as a person to sort of give you advice and to also commiserate if, if necessary. Um, and I think the last thing that sort of occurred to me is, uh, the notion of, and you mentioned this earlier about like fitting in and, um, I would say that, you know, high school and college, um, even though at the time it seems like they are the be all end all of all the things. <laughs> and like, it, it's just like encompassing your entire world. It is such a tiny fraction of what you will do. And so I think as hard as it is to have that perspective, knowing that that's the case and knowing that, you know, those four or eight years will not define necessarily what you are capable of after, um, is something that's sort of helpful to keep in mind. Like, because between those eight years, like it never would have occurred to me that looking back, I would be where I am now. Like that wasn't even like, I wasn't working toward that. Like that was just not a thing in my head. And so <laughs> it just sort of allowed me to stay open-minded about where, you know, life takes you in that, in that way. Um, and yeah. And, and just sort of be open and flexible and know that even if you will find yourself in a tough situation, it's probably not going to last. And everything in that, in that sense is temporary. So I think that, um, yeah, those are the sort of, things that I've learned over the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's some really great advice for really anyone who's trying to look for um, their passion and who's struggling because uh, I know for sure that um, I'm, I seem to be struggling now, but it's, it might get worse from here. It might get better, but um, mm -hmm. it's just to kind of look at it with the perspective that um, you have so much time to actually figure out and it it's, doesn't have to be defined by, a certain amount of time, like this is when you have to do this and this is when you have to do this. It's not fully linear in that way. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really great piece of advice. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So very last question. Um, if you could kind of give some advice, I know you kind of did include a lot of advice in the last question, but uh, more specifically for girls or anyone who wants to pursue mathematics, um, do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I mean, aside from go for it, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is that um, as a girl or woman, woman in math or, um, you know, non 
minority gender identity or non-majority gender identity, I think that um, we're always sort of hesitant to go for things where we don't necessarily see representation mirrored. And if we don't see other, you know, women in mathematics or black women in mathematics, then how do we know that that's a thing that we can do? Because arguably the people around you are going to dissuade you from doing that because they don't see the representation either. And so one thing that I would suggest now that um, the internet is so widely used and available. I mean, like this was not a thing for me when I was in, you know, the internet was like very, very new when I was in high school. Um, But I think, you know, just like looking up these things and just doing searches, I mean, there's so many resources out there, not just from the perspective of like the technical and math, pieces, but also just sort of like the personal stories of people and, and, and their different trajectories, because not everyone is the same. So I think, um, you know, just sort of seeking out resources that show you that there are other people, even if you're in your immediate environment, you don't see that I think is important. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, um, it's very easy for, us as women to compare ourselves to other people, whether that's other women or um, men or whoever. And I think that we have to be very careful about what that looks like, because especially sort of in, in my position and, you know, in thinking about my trajectory, it's, it's often hardest because I am my own worst critic Mm -hmm. and it doesn't take much to, you know, look at somebody else and come up with some conclusion that's negative about yourself and your ability to do what it is that you're, you're striving for. And so as difficult as it is to not compare yourself to other people, because everybody has a different story. Everybody has, you know, you, you only see a version of that whether that's what they present to the world or how you're interpreting what they present to the world. And that's it. But because everybody has um, a different perspective, you have to sort of keep that in mind when you're thinking about like, oh, I could never do what this person is because they are A, B, and C. And it's like, well, they appear to be A, B, and C, but (laughs) you know, you don't actually know what the underlying portion is. And, And the same thing goes for in the reverse where other people sort of look at me and see a certain version of me. And I'm just like, wait, what? (laughs) (laughs) I don't get it. Right. And so I think, you know, as hard as it is to do that and keep some level of sort of perspective about your ability and your right to be wherever it is that you are, um, that's something that you sort of have to hold on to, even if you don't see that mirrored in your environment. Again, great great piece of advice. I, I was just actually thinking about this um, yesterday, um, about how kind of figuring out where you belong and at the same time not letting other people get to you, like it's it's a really hard balance to kind of keep. Mm-hmm. Um, and you like touched on it perfectly and I couldn't have said it better. Um, and so I think, you know, just for anyone who wants to pursue math from as far as I can see, it's it's just like any other field because it's it's just, you know, your mindset on how you're going to take it. It isn't really much else. Um, and I think that that's a message that needs to be conveyed more freely and openly in, like, education spaces and stuff, too, so that it doesn't dissuade women and people that are not um, generally inclined to doing things like this. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I really Absolutely, enjoyed- my pleasure. I hope you guys all enjoyed today's episode. I learned so much about accepting yourself and not giving into imposter syndrome no matter what career you decide to pursue. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe down below. Make sure to check out Erica's LinkedIn, which is also going to be down below, and follow me on Instagram for updates about the show. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay strong, and stay snazzy. Vale!